Welcome to the stage, the moderator of our third panel, Dr. Jamila Taylor, as well as our panelists, Aza Nadari, Charles Johnson, and Kylie Mayfield. Dr. Taylor, who will be introducing our panelists, is the president and CEO of the National WIC Association the nonprofit voice of the 12,000 public health nutrition service provider agencies and the more than 6.3 million mothers, babies, and young children served by the Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, also known as WIC. Dr. Taylor um, is relatively new in her role. I believe she's been there for a little under a year, and we are just so proud of her. Um, she has spent her entire career working tirelessly to improve outcomes for moms, babies, and families. We appreciate her continued commitment to this important cause. She has been a trusted partner and friend since the Black Maternal Health Caucus was first established, and I'm thrilled to turn it over to her now to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Awesome. It is so great to see all of you in person. I feel like I've had some challenges this morning making people out from seeing them on the screen versus in, in person, but this is really amazing. Um, and so I am so delighted and honored that, you know, Congresswoman Underwood asked me to be here today to moderate this esteemed panel. Um, I want to start this out by saying that we up here are among friends. These are some of the most trusted advisors that I go to when it comes to maternal health issues. And then also just to, to talk and sometimes quite frankly vent about the frustrations that we have been seeing as we've been trying to get these really important policy initiatives over the finish line. And so I'm not gonna belabor this panel with long remarks because I want us to get right into this important conversation. But what I will do is introduce everyone on the panel and then we'll get started. So first we have Aza Nadari, who's the executive director and co-founder of Mama Toto Village. Aza brings more than 15 years. Woo, that's right. Yes. Um, Aza brings more than 15 years of experience in community organizing, reproductive health education, and program management and development. She is a certified professional midwife and family counselor. Aza is a fiercely dedicated woman who believes that by promoting health equity, the reduction of barriers in maternal and child health begins to dissipate giving rise to healthy individuals, healthy families, and healthy communities. Next to Aza, we have Charles Johnson, who is the founder of For Kira For Moms. His passion for systemic change is driven by the love of his wife, Kira, who passed away following the birth of their second child. In April of 2016, Kira underwent a routine C-section following an uncomplicated pregnancy. Hours later, she died from internal hemorrhaging despite adamant pleas for help from medical professionals by her husband and loved ones. Her story exemplifies the current crisis happening in America, rising rates of maternal mortality and the silencing of black voices. And last but not least, we have Kylie Mayfield, who is the RH Impact Director of Community Power Building. She's responsible for policy and advocacy initiatives on state and local levels, primarily in Louisiana and New Orleans. Driven by her life experiences and observation of the impacts of systemic oppression on the health of black underserved communities, her passion is to reduce racial disparities and improve overall health of those community members. So another round of applause for our panelists. So my first question for today is going to go to Aza. Aza, at Mama Toto, you lead efforts to create career pathways in maternal health and to provide accessible perinatal support services. Can you describe the importance of these two aspects of your mission and what type of support your organization and organizations like yours will need to carry out this critical work? 
Thank you for that question. And it's good to see so many of my friends in here. Um, so these two aspects of our mission intersect to cultivate the conditions necessary for black women and birthing people to thrive. Cultural reflexivity and congruence within the perinatal workforce is a critical component of transforming maternal health outcomes and ensuring that those who are caring for black women are not only highly skilled, but have the emotional intelligence to facilitate respectful and dignified care. Representation, um, as has been discussed, is important, but it does not go the distance. It is not enough. Um, but framing perinatal workforce development in human rights and in reproductive and birth justice and challenging anti-blackness in our academic trainings and programs does. And it's what we do at Mama Toto Village. We intentionally seek out those in our priority community, whether they are former clients, whether they are career changers, and offer them training tracks, whether it's perinatal community health workers or lactation consultants, community doulas, and in the very near future, we'll be training midwives. Um, but what we've seen at Mama Toto Village um, and in models that are led by many of our sister organizations around the country, I see Jessica here and Dorian from Root um, and whoever else is in the room um, from organizations, um, we know that comprehensive perinatal and accessible support, um, that these models do improve outcomes. Recently, we completed a three-year evaluation on our home visiting model and data show that this program does in fact improve preterm birth rates. And since beginning this program in 2015 and serving over 2,000 black women and birthing people, we have had a 0% maternal mortality rate. And so, thank you. And so organizations like Mama Toto Village, like Ancient Song, like Southern Birth Justice, like Root, um, so many other folks who are working at all angles of maternal health, not only do we require transformative financial investments, um, but we also need organizational development and capacity building, and organizations need capital investments to purchase property um, and safe spaces for folks in the community, but also need the resources so that people have the personal capacity to continue to do this work as well. Thanks so much, Aza. I think another point too, um, you know, community-based organizations are on the front lines serving the communities. And I think another key piece too that we tend to forget about is the fact how important it is, particularly for black women, to go to a provider that looks like them. Um, you know, go to, to go somewhere where they see themselves or they see their loved ones and their families. And this in turn, really does have an impact on our maternal health crisis. You know, as Aza mentioned, you know, these are evidence-based best practices when it comes to serving our communities. And so just wanted to also lift that up and thank you so much for your comments. Um, and so my next question goes to Charles. Charles, many people have become familiar with your family story thanks to the incredible advocacy you've done over the years. From the time you started your advocacy efforts to now, what has changed and what progress have you seen and where do we go next? <laughs> right. Is this working? You won't break my soul, like goodness gracious. Like the fact that we're setting that type of tone here. Um, you know, this is just so amazing, Dr. Taylor. And, um, I really had a really heavy heart this morning as I sat back and thought about this journey over the past seven years. And um, Kira used to always say something to me that was just so simple when she was proud of something um, that I was doing and was just, you know, go baby, go. And I just really know that she's just smiling down, looking at all of us, just simply saying, go baby, go. And so when we look at where we've come, and I just wanna be clear, when we see the data, when we see the stories, and we know that we saw an explosion in the number of maternal deaths during the pandemic, and we saw data, and sometimes this data is overwhelming and it's discouraging, but I want everybody in this room to be crystal clear that we are by no means losing this fight. And that when we look around this room and we see the type of partnerships in 2017, we had to fight, scratch, and claw to get one piece of legislation 
through Congress, through the House, and to the President's desk to get signed. And the fact that we're back here with more than a dozen pieces of legislation boldly called the Black Maternal Health Momnibus, um, it's amazing. And so the way that people are coming to the table from grassroots organizations to corporate partners that are showing up in significant ways to insurance carriers to the way that leadership is galvanized around this Black Maternal Health Caucus is something that we cannot take for granted. Cannot take for granted, and it truly is a testament to your leadership, Representative Underwood, and to the leadership of uh, Representative uh, Adams and the entire staff. Um, but I am truly a believer that when we pass the Black Maternal Health Momnibus, um, that this will put us on a path to talking about the Black Maternal Health Crisis and the American Maternal Health Crisis in the historical context sooner than later. Thank you, Charles. Next, I'm going to go to Kylie. Kylie, you're the director of community power building at RH Impact. We hear the term community-based organization used a lot. But what does community power building look like? And what does it mean in the mission to address maternal mortality in our country? So good evening, every I mean, good morning, everyone, first of all. Um, community power building looks like upholding and respecting the expertise and the experience of the community in efforts to optimize health and well-being. Um, we have to make sure that we include the community early on in the conversations instead of an afterthought. And so for at the Reproductive Health Impact, we want to ensure that community um, is centered in all aspects of our work. So not just the community power building team, but when we look at policy, when we look at research, when we look at trainings, just ensuring that the voices and expertise of community is uplifted in every room, even if we don't necessarily have a community member or a CBO partner in that room. Also sharing our power, making space for community to join us in, in different various rooms. Um, for example, a lot of the funding opportunities that the community power building team works on or has worked on in the past, we've included um, our CBO partners to ensure that they are also benefiting from our name, the leveraging platform that we have. So sharing that power. And I also think that um, community power building looks like equitable and supportive um work to the community and cbos and also taking that time because all of the time community doesn't understand all of the language and the the jargon the professional jargon and i've seen people get irritated with questions from community community doesn't always feel like they have the space to ask questions um and we also talk fast so slowing down making space for community um defining terms just in my experience working in policy and inviting community to engage in policy in Louisiana, in, yeah, in Louisiana, you know, sometimes we have to sit down like, hey, this is how the process works. Everybody doesn't remember I'm just the bill from Schoolhouse Rock. And it doesn't always look that way or what you think it looks like. So explaining the policy, explaining to showing people how they can actually go on the Louisiana website to follow legislation and how to also engage with their um, policymakers. Uh, let me see, is there anything else? Oh, most important, we have to recognize that community holds the power. I mean, holds the, well, they do hold the power, and they also have the answer. And many times, they've already voiced the answers, but no one has listened. No one has uplifted what they said. So just ensuring that community hasn't, doesn't have to keep repeating themselves or talking, but not being heard. Um, yeah. So. I think that's how organizations can um, help build power in community. And also, the last thing, y'all, sorry. And also, including community in building resources. Not just sharing resources, but including community because our, what we think community might need, that may not be what the community is interested in and it may not be what they have identified as a need. Thank you so much, Kylie. I just want to say, too, I think one of the, the key pieces of what you were describing in terms of building that community 
is the fact that you know the process to craft and pull the momnibus together, um, Representative Underwood and her team were so intentional about engaging community-based organizations really throughout the process um, in this legislation. And so, me as someone, you know, I'm kind of kind of an OG um, here on Capitol Hill. You know, I've worked in Washington for over two decades, and I had never seen that type of collaborative process before, especially engaging organizations on the front lines, working directly with communities. It wasn't about lobbyists um, in the process to build the momnibus, and so just want to thank um, Congresswoman Underwood for that process. Thank you. Um, so that's a good segue um, back to AZA. You know, as one of our key leaders up here representing a community-based organization, you've spoken at events here on the Hill um, at the Department of Health and Human Services and across the country on black maternal health issues. What do government officials need to understand about effective policy making that would have the greatest impact on improving maternal health outcomes and advancing birth equity? So I think the key word is effective, um, which means to be successful in producing a desired or intended result. So the Momnibus was introduced as a full package, yet it was not fully passed. Um, myself and many of my colleagues, um, including those who are on this panel, have spoken before Congress, the Senate, the UN, and so many um, political stages, some of the biggest political spaces um, in this country, yet Roe fell, yet abortion bans exist, yet reproductive justice is still something that we are trying to actualize fully, and yet black mothers and babies are still dying from preventable causes. Um, and to Charles's point, we have come so far from where we started, um, and yet we still have so many miles to go. Um, effective policy will not only improve maternal health outcomes, but it will transform them and hold the people and systems accountable for harm. Additionally, it would be inclusive of the labor and the research and the input of a multitude of stakeholders who have provided the answers and the policy language for many years. Um, effective policies will ensure a strong safety net in housing and maternal health in finances, in ensuring that people have access to concrete and basic resources. I think if COVID showed us anything, it was that red tape is a facade, that bipartisanship is possible, and that our government can create, pass, and implement policies with expediency. And so effective policies have been written, as Dr. Taylor said, with community input and community investment, and that is what the Momnibus is, and I think that that is the solution and that is the answer, and I think the urgency to pass that bill, to get it done, um, is the effective solution that we need. And back to Charles, um, want to shed a spotlight on one of the pieces of the Bombnibus, the Kara Johnson Act, which is named after your wife. Would providing funding directly and exclusively to community-based organizations is what the, the Kara Johnson Act does. Why is this bill and this funding so important? Absolutely. Thank you. So um, I think that really and truly Kylie hit it on the head. The reality of the situation is that the community has the answers, right? And so that's one of the elements of this legislation that I'm proudest of, is that we are being deliberate about the funding for community-based and oftentimes black women-led organizations, right, that are in the communities doing the work, catching the babies, right? And oftentimes what we see is all of us who have, who are either in this work or who have relationships with people who are on the front lines is that they are doing the absolute most with the least, right? And so it's really time for us to prioritize ensuring that these organizations have everything that they need, making sure that the community organizations have the resources they need to serve the people to their fullest capacity, making sure that midwives and doulas are not just paid a living wage, but a thriving wage, right? These are all things that being intentional will result in. And so uh, once again, I just really have to echo the sentiments of everybody else up here that this is a huge part of what is special about this legislation is that it was a collaborative effort that was informed 
by the community, by people that are doing this work, like I said, was not pulled by purse strings or special interests. It was pulled by the heartstrings of people who were on the front lines. Great, thank you, Chair. Kylie, back to you. Uh, much of your work has been in Louisiana, as I mentioned, and it is a state with one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the country. What types of solutions are needed in, place, in places like Louisiana and other areas with high rates of pregnancy-related deaths and significant disparities in outcomes? Um, the, first, oops, the first solution that I can, that I'll share is breaking down the silos between people who are doing the same work. I think a lot of the times there have been sectors have, who haven't been in communication with each other. So having that cross-sectoral collaboration that's um, in effect. Um, and for example, in Louisiana, we began the Mama Plus Health Policy Agenda, and that was kind of our spin on the Black Maternal Health Momnibus. And it began with two of our partners, which are Black-led organizations in New Orleans, Institute of Women and Ethnic Studies, as well as Birthmark Doula Collective. And through that work, we ended up reaching out to our networks, having our network reach out to their networks, seeing if others were interested in engaging with us in this work. And through that work group, we had representatives from various CBOs in New Orleans, and it has now expanded outside of New Orleans to in, um, include more people across the state. Um, we have representatives from the Louisiana Perinatal Quality Collaborative, representatives from academia and researchers, representatives from the health departments, the Louisiana Health Department, as well as the New Orleans Health Department, and just allowing space for everyone to engage and inviting community members, community who may not necessarily be a part of a CBO, inviting students, because a lot of the time students, they have new answers and new solutions. And also through that, um, through our Mama Plus Health Policy Agenda, we host every year Black Maternal Health Advocacy Day. And we hold that during Black Maternal Health Week, which is also during our legislative session. And we use those opportunities to connect with legislators to share with them the issues, but how the issues are connected to maternal health issues. And so through our work, having this cross um, sectoral work, we have been able to pass legislation to reimburse doulas in the state of Louisiana. We've been able to pass legislation to um, increase the reimbursement rates for midwives through Medicaid. We've, we were the first state to extend Medicaid um, for during the postpartum period. So I think just breaking down those walls and having communication um, with people in the various sectors. Um, and then the next one, the next solution that I'll share is um, connecting with coalitions with similar interests. Connecting with coalitions with similar interests and building that support because there is power in numbers. And every time you're able to make more connections, going to support their advocacy days on the Capitol, them coming to support your advocacy days, the legislators are taking notice of the numbers. And even for Black Maternal Health Advocacy Day, we all wear Black Birth Matter shirts. So imagine 50, for example, Black Birth Matter shirts walking throughout the um, halls of the Louisiana State Capitol. People take notice and we stand proud and we uplift the community and allow community community members to speak and have a presence with whatever we're doing. Great, thank you, Kylie. Um, so I think we have five more minutes. I am gonna throw in a question that I just thought of to the panelists. Aza is giving me the evil eyes for this. Um, you know, but, but something that I wanted to bring up, you know, and this, this largely comes from my own experience and really just all of us up here and, you know, as we've been talking about the engagement of community-based organizations really in advocacy and in policy work and um, one challenge that I've seen from community-based organizations is, you know, not having staff to support, you know, their engagement in policy and advocacy. And so just wanted to ask all of you, you know, what is your advice to community-based organizations that may be in the room or listening, you know, if they do want to do more to expand their policy advocacy work, what advice would you have to them? 
given the fact that they are oftentimes, you know, resource constrained. So they may not have money to hire, you know, an extensive policy director, for example. Who wants to start? Anyone? I can go. Um, my advice, my recommendation would be to reach out to organizations who are already doing the work. Um, like I said, for our Mama Plus Health Policy Agenda, we invite everybody. Don't feel intimidated for a lack of knowledge. Ask questions. Be okay with supporting what's already going on. So, and just uh, support whenever you can. So that's one of the recommendations that I do have. So I would say um, this is very actually very much my own journey and our organization's experience for a very long time. Um, and I would say definitely trying to find your way to as many tables as you can. Um, I was just, I sat quietly for a while and just kind of listened so I could myself learn the language and who, who was who in each, um, each of the spaces. Um, also getting um, signed up for alerts so that you know what bills that are coming down that are related to the issue area that you are focused on um, and finding ways to participate in that if they have a hearing show up um, write a testimony if they have comment period comment um, those are ways to get engaged and at least start to get your feet wet if you are in an executive leadership position you should be showing up, you actually should have that knowledge, and I know that many of us are already stretched thin, so carving out at least, even if it's like two hours of your week, um, to delve into what's updated and what's the latest in the policy space. Um, read reports that are coming out. Um, I used to read a lot of reports by Dr. Taylor um, and by some of the other people who are um, in this space who do a lot of writing about black maternal health policy. And that was my beginning education. I think I'll just simply say everything that they said, <laughs> right? <laughs> Know when to listen and learn. Um, thank you, Charles. And then one last thing. I just wanted to plug the Black Maternal Health Federal Policy Collective, which is a group that I actually brought together. Thank you. Um, and, you know, it is really, I think the thought process behind it was really to bring, you know, to be quite honest, young women working in policy positions or in community-based organizations, just any black woman that cared about black maternal health policy that wasn't necessarily welcome, welcomed in other advocacy spaces, um, a place where we could be together, um, enjoy each other's company, but also learn from each other. And so that group is still operating. And so if folks want to get involved, you know, definitely let me know, um, as well as our colleagues at the Century Foundation. I'm looking at Vina, who's sitting in the front row here and who is also going to be speaking today. So just wanted to flag that. And so I think we are at time, even though I did have some more questions. Um, but thank you all so much for listening and looking forward to continuing this wonderful day with you all. Dr. Taylor, real quickly, could I just have a point of personal privilege? Could everybody join me and stand to your feet and give a round of applause for Jack DiMatteo, who is gonna be leaving us We're and transitioning on. Jack, if it wasn't for you, we would not yes. be here. We're so grateful for all your hard work, for what you've meant to this movement, and we're wishing you all the best, brother.